I'd like to introduce Dr. Lena Peikoff. Thank you. I'm here to answer questions tonight. I have some answers if you have some questions. I have no lecture and very little tidbits prepared here and there. So I just want to start by saying briefly, I have been asked several times, why did you reject three areas in your uh, Q&A? Well, it should be pretty obvious that I left out physics because I don't know physics. Anything that I know in physics, I learned from Dave Harriman, and it makes much more sense for you to ask him than to ask me, who would just then call him up, get his answer, and come back and give it. (laughs) As far as the presidential election, of course, I definitely have knowledge and very strong convictions about it, but I think we should have a pleasant (laughs) evening, and I don't, uh, to be quite frank, I do not have emotional control in discussing that topic, and especially not with objectivist audiences. If I talk to enemies, I don't expect anything, so I don't get upset. But I do on that topic, so I just want to keep it off limits. I don't even want to tell you what I'm going to do, because someone will say, well, why don't you do that instead? Now, with regard to technical epistemology, I may have may have misled you. I am not talking about epistemology on the level that I cover it in OPAR, for instance, which I consider general uh, epistemology. I mean by uh, technical epistemology, I I worked for an outfit many decades ago, and my job was to answer by mail, there was no email then, all of the philosophic questions uh, that they submitted. And I remember, this is my definition of technical epistemology, one of the questions came in, Ayn Rand says that concepts are formed by measurement omission. The is a concept. Could you explain what measurements are omitted to form the? And I, so I went to them and I said, am I supposed to answer this? And they said, absolutely, we answer every question. So I called her up and we had a long discussion. I got all notes on it all and I condensed it. It was really, you know, a good little essay on the, and at the time it circulated. <laughs> But I mean, so what? It didn't do a thing. It was a lot of work, and that's what I call technical. Uh, now, I'm not saying all technical questions are, are uh, not of value, but uh, too many of them that are posed to me are like that. And the fact is that I am not an epistemologist, let alone a technical one. The older I get, I realize I'm not a philosopher. <laughs> And never really was. My real interest in life is cultural analysis. How does philosophy influence, for instance, the rise of Hitler or uh, the kind of educational system we have or great plays? That's always been the type of thing that I've done. The only exception is Opar, which was pure philosophy, but that was simply paying off a debt. I had to do that to Ayn Rand in exchange for uh, what she had, you know, taught me for 30 years. But other than that, uh, I never would want to write or really lecture on uh, philosophy. I don't say there's anything wrong with that, but that is just not uh, what I do. So I had to, in advance, squelch people who want to talk about the higher mysteries of uh, measurement uh, omission. So I have a bundle of written questions if, uh, you know, you run out of oil ones. Every once in a while I'll take them, but I see that there looks like a few, so, okay. With regard to people who, acting on Ragnar's imperative, fail to file a personal income tax return, do they help or hurt objectivism? You have no <clears throat> justification in breaking the law and putting yourself uh, at risk uh, of uh, retaliation, more so if you, uh, uh, if you do it uh, in the context of defending a certain philosophy and get it put in the position of uh, being a lawbreaker. So long as you are living in a society, you rely on persuasion and on the rule of law. Now, if you reach the point that you've gone on strike against society and you're officially taking the position of a revolution, even if underground, that's, of course, you then you stop, like you threw the tea, uh, you know, in, in the Boston Tea Party. But we have not yet reached that stage. There's not enough people to do it. 
And <clears throat> you're still hoping that it's possible for persuasion and education to change things. So if you, uh, if you don't file an income tax return, don't do it on the basis that objectivism says it's wrong for the government to steal. Uh, it's just the same as if the, the, the uh, mafia comes and threatens to break your leg if you don't pay them off. You don't say objectivism requires me to break my leg. Uh, I mean, you do what your survival requires in the face of force, and particularly in a social uh, context where you still have a chance of, uh, you have a chance, I don't know how good a chance, but a chance to change things. Right here. Yes. Um, what kind of fiction are you reading these days? Well, believe it or not, I am dominantly reading science fiction. Uh, which I never liked, but partly I ran out uh, of other times. No, but partly I've been able to define what is the type of science fiction I like. I hate those ones that start King whatever let ten ziggurats of gloop out into, you know, and it's all uh, some unintelligible dimension. I like science fiction that start in a perfectly daily, realistic setting, everything is normal, and then one thing happens that's unusual, that, you know, or even contrary to fact, and the rest is the implications of that, that one fact. And it's like an act of abstraction. What would life be like if this one thing were different? And there are many, many brilliant books on science fiction, which once I realized that's what I want, that uh, are absolutely fascinating. In fact, I've got to the point where I think, you know, when I finish my present book, uh, assuming that happens, I'm I'm going to try to write a novel, and it's going to be a science fiction novel. So. Uh, Doctor, uh, Ayn Rand died in 1982. Right. You know, we have been, I guess, uh, fighting a battle for longer than that. <laughs> so my point is this: we are a constitutional republic. We have a constitution that is written and everybody knows or supposed to know it. Why we haven't established a program of challenging the government on any program that shows that we are living in a world of contradictions, <coughs> as Ayn Rand taught me to live in a world without uh, contradictions. Uh, the, the short answer to your question is a, co a constitution cannot even be interpreted, let alone defended, except by reference to a fundamental overall philosophy. It grew out of the Enlightenment view of this world, of man, of reason, of science, and therefore of the individual and individual rights. But if you take all of that away, and all you have is unreason and religion and faith and uh, skepticism and uh, individual helplessness, as no one can pay attention to the, con uh, to the Constitution as it is. It's like a relic of, uh, of, of a dark age to the contemporary uh, mentality. So, moreover, uh, the, the only thing, therefore, they can do with it is to continually reinterpret it. They say it doesn't really mean what it says, you know, from the time of Oliver Wendell Holmes on. Everything changes, there are no absolutes. And, the Constitution wasn't intended to establish some one economic system, and, you know, so that you know, they ch changed the whole thing from defense of individual rights to the defense of procedural rights. So uh, they use the language of defense of rights, but it doesn't any longer have anything like the constitutional meaning. It would be ridiculous, hopeless, futile to try to fight a battle by reference to whether uh, the, the country, the measure of the policy is constitutional or not. It's okay to toss that in but that, on some specific issue, but that is not uh, going to get you anywhere uh, as far as uh, affecting what's going on today. Will that expose the philosophy of objectivism to the, to the total public a little bit more no. by challenging you that? You cannot... You cannot promote a philosophy by reference to the last consequence of some philosophy that is no longer accepted. And it's the same thing. So please don't argue that one. Dr. Peacock, do you think that uh, any attempt to do a dim analysis in the field of music would first require the development of what 
Miss Randa described in Art and Cognition as uh, the appropriate aesthetic principles, uh, which would uh, serve as the the base of the objective validation of aesthetic just judgment within music. And no, um, okay, <laughs> Do, I wouldn't even know how to apply it, let alone how to draw aesthetic implications from it. I had enough trouble with the fields that I chose. So. No, I understand your reason for choosing literature. It, it's, um, I, can, I only can apply it to conceptual. You know, like, uh, that's why I chose literature. Uh, of course, I think it's the most difficult, but also the most uh, eloquent of a culture, but be, because it's the one that you can talk about most easily because it's medium, this concept. Even painting is much harder to present objectively, but sound, I wouldn't even dream of knowing how to come at it. Right, and I, w- I wanted to find out if you know of any progress that has m- possibly been made within objectivism to investigate Miss Rand's hypothesis regarding the nature of man's response to music that she talks about. No, I don't know anything. I, okay. I get that question all the time, but I should have a standard form. You know. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, let you. me take one or two of these written questions now, but don't, don't go away. I'll be fine. Uh, do you think that environmentalism with its concomitant acceleration of the loss of freedom is turning America more towards the society depicted in Anthem. Well, yes and no. It's certainly leading us toward, you know, the destruction of the whole uh, industrial society and the destruction of individual freedom. But I wouldn't... uh, Anthem was a pure projection of collectivism. And I have a different idea of what's going to ultimately triumph if the worst happens, and I don't think it's going to be collectivism. Collectivism is, is a more modern phenomenon as a, as a dominant, world-dominant uh, political force. As the idea you have to subordinate the individual to the group, to mankind, to humanity, to society. And that's why the group is more important than the individual. But I don't think that that is going to stay the, the dominant uh, evil. I think you can, uh, right now you can look around and see that uh, collectivism is, of course, still popular on the left, but the left is uh, not where we're going. Now, you're taking me into my book, so I won't go further than that right now, but I think it's anthem, but with a, uh, some big differences. Instead of the Council of Scholars, I, I see a pope and everything else that that implies. Since the theme of the conference is cultural change, can you talk about what you think we should do to make bring about change in the culture? Well, <clears throat> your own knows a lot more than I do about what you should do practically. I only know to write, uh, you know, maybe appear on uh, the radio. That's all uh, I could do, and those are very long-range uh, things. If I knew that you could do something other than that, more short-range and direct, that would change the world, I would say that's fabulous. I'd still write my book, but then I would say, you know, it's like it's a a personal uh, pleasure, and I wouldn't care about the effects. I I think that's one of your purposes in this, is to find those things out. And if so, I'll find out from your own. You know, what the upshot is, but I have nothing to contribute on that. I wish I did. Yes. I have a question about Atlas Shrugged. Um, a particular line near the end of the story when uh, they're leaving New York uh, and they look down and the lights of New York go out. Uh, Galt said to Dagny something along the lines of, don't look down. And I never understood that line because it seemed to seem not to fit with Galt's entire metaphysics. I was wondering if you could could comment on uh, that scene in that line, what was uh, what was actually meant by it. Uh, I don't see that as anything more than a stress on his strength and protectiveness. He's not trying to get her to evade the fact. She knows what's going on, but it's going to have a kind of an emotional scarring effect just from the fact that you see such a disaster. So it would be the same would be basically if, if a man and his beloved were entering a concentration camp and there were a pile of corpses. Uh, if he said, don't look, that doesn't imply, as, as I think you might be wondering, you know, d- derogation of the female. Or, it's, it's nothing like that. It's just a part of uh, the idea of a man protecting a woman. I mean, if there was a reason for it, if she was writing an article, you know, something. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, hi, I'm not not sure how to phrase this question, but uh, I think in in one of your writings you compared it something related to my question to Dominique throwing a statue out a window that she loved, uh, whatever. But um, a question I've had uh, that I've observed is people who really love Ayn Rand and her works and are, are objectivists and would speak about her positively and to their friends. Uh, when it comes to uh, a group environment or, you know, people they don't know or whatever, her name just doesn't come up. It's like a kind of like she's either so precious to them they don't want to talk about her or something, whereas if you were talking about Karl Marx, the name just flows out. But Ayn Rand's name somehow... Well, doesn't. first of all, you know? I've been in a lot of such situations and observed them, and I haven't seen that as a tendency. If anything, what I've seen is that they're too uh, mm. assertive. <laughs> and call her total strangers and say... You know, you better change your mind about God because you're leading the world to disaster. And, and that's not a good idea either. There are a lot of contexts in which it's appropriate uh, not to say anything. If you feel the audience is uh, antagonistic or it's uh, like it's a funeral or somebody's wedding or whatever, uh, or the host you know has certain strong views and you agreed to come anyway, it would be totally inappropriate to burst in and start proselytizing. It's not your goal as an individual to uh, go out and spread objectivism in every context. You raise it where you think a person is interested and where, where it's appropriate. And I don't think anybody is in a position to generalize what objectivists in general do. There might be objectivists who are afraid to antagonize people so that even in the appropriate context, they don't want to say anything. I've certainly seen that. But I've seen the other two, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't generalize. Now, why do you think there are fewer women objectivists than men? Well, I mean, that has no way restricted to objectivism. There are fewer women in every intellectual movement except feminists. <laughs> and there are fewer women in every field in history. From back to Egypt on. So uh, the question is why? And I think a good part of it is the way women were regarded and regarded themselves. In a, in a pre-industrial society, raising children, uh, being able to survive, physically getting the food and so on, was, you know, you didn't just call uh, on the internet and they delivered everything. Uh, it, it was a literally a, an exhausting, backbreaking, full-time job. And similarly, for the, the, the man, the father, who had to uh, go out and try to scrape something out of the ground. So it was, uh, it was a division of labor that was just handed on and on. And it was only in the last, uh, I would say, century or so. There always were some exceptions uh, in, in every field, but it was only in the last century that I know that uh, wealth uh, reached the point that women were totally liberated and had the freedom and the wealth and so on, and that division of labor was no longer a requirement of survival. And I've seen a number of couples now where the husband stays home and looks after the kids and the wife goes out to work. When I was growing up, that would have been considered inconceivable. But it's, it's normal. So... I think the situation has changed, and I think that there's a lot more self-assertiveness uh, among uh, women. I do not think that the implication is men are intellectual and women are emotional, because there certainly are, if you judge by the history of philosophy, a hell of a lot of emotionalist uh, men. But I guess that so far it hasn't, uh, you know, you have millennia to overcome. So, and I don't think the feminist movement is helping because it's pushing to the forefront all the people that would not go for a, a rational uh, movement. But I think in, in time, if uh, freedom continues, I mean, Ayn Rand is an example. She was uh, pretty good. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she was a woman, so, uh, and she was certainly an objectivism. So. <laughs> Although she, she wouldn't call it that, but... Quality over quantity. Yeah, quality over quantity, but I think you can have both. Um, 
Can one have a happy retirement past the age of 70 while existing off past productivity with no attempt at new productivity? Well, I just say flat out no. Now, you don't have to have, you know, a super demanding productiveness. I you don't have to make it full time. But in my uh, experience of myself and others, if you just say, okay, I've had it now for any long range function, any long range of thought, I'm just going to now drift because that's what it would mean if you give up the realm of productiveness in any form. I'm just going to go shopping one day and to the beach one day and lie around, watch TV and play computer games or whatever. You die, you atrophy mentally. And they have, uh, they have uh, evidence of this. Uh, what, there's correlation between a retirement, which means you do nothing, and uh, an earlier death rate. So I think uh, there's, there's definite evidence. Uh, and you, I can, you can see why. It's like you're giving up one of the crucial things that make you have a, a, a direction in life, a self-esteem, a functioning mind. And uh, I don't care if you're 90. Now, you know, you don't have to be productive in the sense of, you know, turn out wealth. Even if you just say, for instance, um, I love bridge. Now I got time to play bridge. But I'm not just gonna play a game here and a game there. I wanna learn bridge. You know, compete. I want to get somewhere, advance. That's fine. I would count that as uh, productivity because it still has. And believe me, I tried. Bridges certainly uses the maximum of your mental capacity much more than philosophy ever did. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's my answer. I do not believe in retirement until you know you're senile. In which case, you don't have to worry. Uh, or you're just physically impaired and you can't do it. So then you're basically in the process of dying. A so. uh, question about the uh, role of uh, philosophy in history. Um, from what little I've learned about history so far, it seems to me there was a major change in the how directly philosophy influenced politics around the time of the Enlightenment. And people started setting up governments and said, basically, let's set up a government according to such and such ideas. And it doesn't seem to me they did that before. Is that accurate? And if so, do you know why? Uh, it's accurate, but not too significant. Hmm. It's, it's accurate in, uh, in the sense that they were much more explicit. The United States was the first country actually founded on an avowed document with the uh, implicit philosophy. I mean, there's no such thing in Greece or their origins just go back into, uh, you know, who knows what. And they say in the medieval period, uh, then the, the 70th century kings just grew out of the uh, earlier ones. So in that sense, it's true. And that was the Enlightenment. That was the culmination of Aristotelianism stripped of a great deal, though not all, uh, of Platonism. So th that's what made it distinctive. But it, it doesn't make a huge difference because every culture has uh, a, a definite politics resting on a definite philosophy. And that's just what, what, I, what I show in Dim, that is not just that, but there's a, there's a certain philosophy that permeates each culture and shows up in different forms in all of its key branches of which politics is one. So whether the people in the society say this is our basis, this is our politics, or not, it's still true that this is their basis and this is their politics. So uh, I don't think it has a big uh, significance. And it's not even help. You might say, well, the significance is it helps you fight off the destruction of the country. But, you know, they just, as soon as the philosophy goes, the, the, the politics which rest on it goes. So... Um, just wanted to ask a quick question back to the issue of environmentalism. I wanted to ask, how does objectivism approach the arguably collective problem of polluting externalities of industry and growing multinational corporations as it okay. attempts to promote wait development wait and innovation at the same time? Too much, too much. The only thing I want to answer of that, I, I should have put that down. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I'll take just the one about the collective pollution. If an individual provably pollutes his neighbor's atmosphere, then he should be sued for violation of property rights. But if the industrial society does it, you, no one should be sued. If it's inherent in an industrial society, you have a choice. You're living now 50 years longer than you would have lived without it. If you don't like it, go leave it alone. Go somewhere else. You have pure air and a 20-year lifespan. But you cannot say to the rest of mankind, I don't like smoke, therefore you die now. And that's what it amounts to. If, if suppose it were the case that, that uh, there was no way, I'm told there is a way, well, I'm sure it's not a wind or so, to, to minimize uh, uh, pollution. But suppose there was no way. A inherent in industrial society was smog like LA has all the time. And it was one or the other. I would say I'm absolutely for the smog thing. I'd rather live 70 years in with my eyes tearing than 20 with them not. Uh, so uh, it's ridiculous to say, what are we going to do uh, about, we'll have to cut back on the industrial civilization uh, because we can't take a particular uh, matter in the atmosphere. If you can't take it, leave town. Leave, you know, there's places, I think there's islands, uh, not in Fiji because it's too civilized, but farther off uh, from Fiji where they have no smoke, uh, just when they, when they light fires, you know, uh, with uh, rubbing matches together, uh, sticks together. That's all I want to say about that. I'm, I'm a total defender of smoke, warming, whatever it is. <laughs> Are there? Yeah. Dr. Peikoff, what do you hope to achieve with your podcast, and where do you see it going in the future? Oh. Well, I'm very happy with my... Uh, podcast. First of all, I enjoy it. Uh, I wanted to get an idea of what is going on in the objectivist world, because I just sit home year after year writing. I've given up, basically, public appearances. So I wanted to get some kind of feeling, and I, I definitely am doing that, and I'm very pleased with the quality of the questions. You know, I throw out some, but uh, there's a surprising number of interesting questions. It seems to be more so than they used to be 20 30 years ago. Well, that's one thing I want. Another thing is, I think there's a number of people, I haven't taken one of those, uh, what do you call it, measurement uh, of your audience, first hits and second hits, whatever, uh, all that is. But I think there's a number of people who are, who are coming to objectivism and then fall into the podcast and then start listening on a regular basis, and then they send a question, how can I get more information on this? And we send them back the names of books. So, so I think it has a certain uh, effect uh, of that kind. But basically I did it because it, it's very wearing to spend your whole time from morning to night on how does the psychoepistemology of Roman literature affect, you know, and it's good for someone to say, you know, is it okay to have sex in an air raid? It's, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's uh, you know, it's light. It's like a dessert after. <laughs> worth it. Yeah. Thank you. Should theoretical scientific research be guided by application? Is it proper to seek scientific knowledge merely out of curiosity without regard for application? Well, that depends who you're talking about. An individual scientist may have his total interest involved in the intellectual discovery, curiosity, advancing the theory. And there's nothing whatever uh, wrong with that if there is some way that uh, he can finance it and support himself. But normally, the way a scientist could finance himself in that kind of activity would be by means of some business that's interested in the applications. And therefore, there's not a dichotomy between them. In, if you now ask about it in regard to man as such, then it is wrong. As such, it should not be uh, a, an endeavor 
to pursue theory without concern for practical application. As a division of labor, that's okay, but not in the platonic sense, that applications are low, they're not worthy, they're not as important as theory, and therefore we should just do theory. It's, it's an interesting question. Let me just do uh, one more here. Oh, yeah, this one. Now, I'm stuck on one of these. And the person lists five uh, genres and says, what are your favorites in each, your favorite in the singer, in each of the following? And I, I can't think of one of them, but the other four. Novel, I'd say Alice Shrug. Play, Cyrano. Uh, painting, uh, Creation of Adam. You can see it. I like Michelangelo. Sculpture, The Dying Slave. And the other one was song. And all I could think of was God Save the King. <laughs> <laughs> Which is definitely not my favorite song. But I don't, I don't, uh, I just don't think of songs. There must be a favorite song, but I can't. Maybe something by Emmerich Coleman. Uh, um, Gone Son of Viber, maybe. Something like that. The, about the one from uh, Gypsy Princess where he sings what life would be like without women. And uh, that was a really good song. I never thought, if you call operetta, then I'd say my favorite song is basically anything by Emmerich Coleman. But I thought you meant like, uh, I did it my way or, you know. <laughs> Okay, well, take this, yeah. I've observed, and in talking with some of the other gay objectivists, I, it's not an observation that's unique to me, that we are somewhat overrepresented as a demographic among objectivists. Who is? Gays. Oh, yeah? And, um... <laughs> <laughs> And I'm wondering if you might have anything to offer as to why that might be the case. I don't even know that it is the case. I mean, how do you know? Um, it just seems like when, when I'm out and about in, yeah. in the outside world, um, in, unless I'm at now, is something... Is true in any state? Or? Well, I mean, I live, in, are, you know, I, I live in California, so I can only speak as far as that. When I'm, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm out and about in when I'm not around something that would typically be considered gay, that I don't come across as many gays as I do when I'm at an objectivist conference. I never heard that one before, but I mean, do you see a problem if it is? No, I was just, it, I just find it, I just found it curious. I never. I, I definitely don't consider it a problem at all. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. I've never <laughs> analyzed that fact. <side. laughs> I think, I think uh, these uh, demographic analyses only hold a very large number. So, like, if you had 20 million objectivists, it probably would even out, you know. I'm not sure. Thank you. Is part of Ayn Rand's validation of the objectivist ethics in conflict with modern biology? And I get this one. I think I've done this on the podcast twice now. Isn't her claim that the automatic functions of living organisms are all aimed at the preservation of the individual organism's life in conflict with the consensus of modern biologists who claim that the ultimate goal is the reproduction of the organism's gene? Well, what is ultimate goal to whom? Now, living organisms don't have an ultimate goal. If you asked... Uh, any copulating animals is, what is your ultimate goal? <laughs> That's ridiculous. They're enjoying themselves. <laughs> Their motive, if you put it in human terms, is have personal, selfish pleasure uh, in their own life. So uh, it, it's got to be either God's ultimate goal or the biologists have got an ultimate goal as a platonic archetype or they've erected Darwin into a floating abstraction. Because in actual reality, the concrete, uh, their goal is judged by what they do. Uh, and their goal, they, they do re reproduce, but they don't aim at reproduction as the consequence. Any more than a cow can get in front of a train and be dead, but it didn't aim uh, at suicide. Now, but then the question uh, can be put this way. Well, but uh, uh, reproduction, why is that a function? Uh, 
in life, if uh, in, a, in, a, in a living organism, if everything is supposed to be for life, for his life. And it's a very simple answer. Where does life come from? How I, uh, was he going to live without being reproduced? Now, you could say, well, if I were God, I would have found a way that he comes out of thinner. And then, so there's no such thing as, you know, passing on uh, genes. But that doesn't happen to be the way reality worked. And reality happens to work in such a way that you can get to be alive only if some preceding generation does something. So in that sense, your selfish life is a function of reproduction. Not that you're doing it to carry it on, but that's the way the setup is. That's the way the nature of a living organism is. So it's not at all the case that there's reproduction versus life and the fact that reproduction refutes life as an end in itself. It's reproduction is the means of life, and uh, the standard is still life. It's not the continuation of life in the next generation. I, I, I don't know, I get this all the time. It must be that biologists are making a big, um, a big issue about reproduction. I guess because that's altruistic and you're serving the next generation. I see that there's going to be no uh, shortage of questions as I have a big stack here of people there. I won't be diverting you or distracting you. I want to tell you just a couple words in answer to the question about how my book is going. Is that okay? Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just do it very rapidly. It's going uh, very well and very badly <laughs> in, the, in these ways. It's going badly in the sense that it's taking, I've, got, I've gone all the way to the end, and I'm back now editing. And the early part, as I remember when I wrote it some years ago, I had really edited it, and it was great. And I went back to this time, I couldn't believe, in the light of having finished, and I now know exactly where I'm going, how many changes, how much uh, rewriting uh, was required. So it's bad in the sense that it's going to take Longer, although I, I now I'm projecting that at the very worst, I'll have it by Christmas of 2010. But that's at the worst. Um, but the good part is that I'm finding it very easy this time around because I do know now exactly where uh, I'm going. And uh, I see now what's relevant and why did I put this in? It's not necessary. And why didn't I put this in? It's necessary. And it's, uh, it's actually an enjoyable process. It's very rare in my life that I've enjoyed the process of actually getting up and going to the desk and picking up the pen and writing. Uh, and, and that's actually happening now. And I'm very, I don't mean to be megalomaniacal, but I'm very happy with the quality of uh, what I'm turning out. I think it's going to be without any doubt far superior to anything I've done uh, before. The other thing to boast again, I'm finally convinced, having gone to the end of the book, that it's correct. <clears throat> you know, I called it the dim hypothesis because I left open this is a, you know, this is a, a possible, probable way of looking at history, but I don't know whether it will ultimately hold up. <clears throat> I'll just tell you one quick thing. Uh, there was the turning point in my mind. I had a lot of evidence that I was right, but I didn't regard it as totally conclusive. And the turning point was when I got to ancient Rome, to Virgil. Uh, now my my uh, overall thesis in the book required Roman literature to have a certain character. And Virgil, of course, is the archetype of Roman literature. The, by far the most famous, acclaimed right away, made co co compulsory in the schools. So if Virgil didn't pass the test, or if I didn't pass the test with Virgil, there was something really wrong uh, with my theory. So I made a list before I hadn't read the Aeneid. Uh, uh, so I just had this prediction solely on the basis of my theory. I made a list of the things that the Aeneid would have to say or clearly imply in order for my thesis to be valid. So I, I but no in advance. And I, I had tremendous apprehension in reading that at some point he's going to say, oh no, I can't believe he did that. <clears throat> I read it through to the end, and I swear it was just as though 
Virgil had said to somebody, what should I put in here to keep Peacock happy? <laughs> <laughs> That is exactly what I predicted. And after that, I stopped worrying. Uh, and it all has worked out. Uh, so I regard that as the turning point. So I think it's going really very well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm a student of philosophy, and I was wondering... What is there still to study within objectivism, within philosophy? I mean, where is there to go? Well, where have you gone? <laughs> um, I've, I've read uh, most of Ayn Rand's writings, and um, I haven't listened to lots of the lectures. I can't afford to buy all of them. I wish I could, but... Well, I don't know. If you, if you haven't uh, got the money or the time or whichever to uh, access a lot of the material, there's no you asking me what, where you can go. Well, I, no, no, I mean, uh, we've, uh, Ayn, with everything Ayn Rand's done and yeah. that you've done... Oh, you mean, is there anything new to discover? Yes, yes. I, how, no one can say that until a person discovers it. <laughs> I mean, that's like, like saying before Edison, well, what is there to invent? <laughs> now, all the inventions have been, oh, we got the steam engine, you know, we have, etc. Uh, I, I certainly, I have enough to do just applying and using what, I've already learned uh, from her. I'd shot my shoot with uh, venture into uh, induction, and that's it. I'm not going into anything new or further. In fact, I'm leaving the field as soon as I finish this book. So it's up to the next generation to come up with where to go. There always it has been, with regard to every philosophy, new ways to you know, develop, uh, apply, etc. But those come uh, across uh, time. Uh, if I knew what they were, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would pursue them, or at least I'd put an email. I'm curious about a certain asymmetry in the dim hypothesis. You have two categories for integration, like proper integration, improper mm -hmm. integration, and misintegration, you name them. But only one category for disintegration, only improper, and there's no category for proper Disintegration. There's no category for proper misintegration. It's a, it's a, it's a mistake. Is proper integration. The pardon? Integration is proper integration. Right. And misintegration is improper right. integration. But well, uh, how can how can there be two types of not doing something? <laughs> the only thing there can be, which I do have, is a division, which it, I'm not going to go into it now, but it amounts to those who are against integration, and those who simply limit it. There is, I make that distinction, but as a tripartite, the analogy I use is balanced diet, macrobiotic diet, and medieval asceticism, where they do as close to the can to not eat it. Now, you could distinguish them. You know, the ascetics uh, who don't eat bread from the ascetics who don't eat rye, but still, they're starving. So I don't, I, I can't argue that point. Yes. Is there anything that you would uh, write differently if you were writing ominous parallels today? Yes, I definitely. I, would, I wouldn't repudiate anything I said in the ominous parallels, but I would m much more stress the uh, religious character of uh, fascism, of Nazism, and the religious influence on its development. Uh, at the time, I really wasn't, I, I knew that there was that element, and I knew all about, you know, the Lutherans who were his big supporters and everything. But I, I, I wrote that at a time when religion, you believe it or not, was simply not taken seriously. In the whole culture, nobody took it seriously. Uh, or if they did, they didn't talk much about it. So, you know, I put it in, but it's like that, that is an ancient uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, and it's only really with... Uh, Seeing what's gone on since Reagan, and then where my own thesis in the dim hypothesis was leading me to, that I realized that I did not give enough indication of the role of, put it this way, the role of the real metaphysics of Hitler. Uh, I, I concentrated too much on epistemology, and within that, too much on instinct and emotion. All of that is certainly true, 
and all of that would have to be said, but it should have been given uh, a much more religious interpretation, both metaphysics and uh, epistemology. You know, not religious in the sense that Hitler was a Christian, but religious in the sense that his system rested on a supernatural world, not just a distortion of biology, which I didn't uh, stress uh, at all. But I make up for it in this book. <laughs> and let's say, I, I don't repudiate it, anything in there, but uh, that, that if I ever did uh, update that or, or write an intro to it or something, I would I definitely have to make that point. Yes? Yeah. Um, as somebody who has a lifelong interest in education, I'm interested to know um, what do you think the goal of education is and also um, how does that goal connect to the intrinsic or extrins extrinsic motivation of children? In other words, whether they're internally motivated to learn what you want them to learn, or whether they well, have to... Well, you know, I've given a whole course, I guess you haven't heard, on philosophy of education. Okay. So uh, I wouldn't want to recapitulate the whole thing, but I agree with you, you have to motivate children. The uh, goal, overall goal, I say, is, should be the development of the conceptual faculty. But obviously, you can't use that in a, in a classroom in a specific subject. You know, you can't say to Johnny, this is to teach you, you know how to connect concepts, uh, you know. So uh, you have to hook on to the child's actual interests so long as those interests are, you know, fruitful or, or productive. But you have to hear my course. I have a whole section on motivation, the proper goal. I will look it up. Thank you. It, it's a course. Uh, it's available somewhere. <laughs> Um, this is a question about uh, Kalman's music. Yes. I was wondering, did Ayn Rand ever talk with you specifically about um, what about his music made her admire it so much? Oh, yeah. We used to listen to it uh, a lot. Um, she liked especially the, the, the happy, really bouncy, cheerful uh, numbers. She thought they were like pure uh, benevolence joy of life. And th those are the ones she would conduct sometimes with her baton, you know, as they were going on. And I was a musher. I liked the lyrical uh, ones, which she also liked, but they were beautiful ballads, you know, where the man declares his love for the woman. And uh, so the, the, it, it would alternate. Uh, so it'd be one of my favorites and one of her favorites. And then some, you know, we, we liked together. Was, they were tremendously melodic. They were very original. Uh, they weren't, uh, for instance, she hated Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, and she, she did not especially like, uh, most of the others didn't like Offenbach. Uh, uh, she didn't particularly like Lehar, although some Lehar she did. But uh, she, she loved Coleman because he was unique. You could hear his style. And there was just nobody else uh, like him. By the way, they're now offering on the internet a complete version of some of his utterly obscure operators that were n never recorded before. Like, uh, I don't know if they're any good because I've disordered them, but Arizona Lady and uh, a few others like that, uh, if you're interested. If you collect common, uh, they're, they're bringing it out now, which is to me is really interesting. Yes. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit. I feel you have had a big influence in cultural change with no I disrespect have? to your own. Yes, you've certainly changed my culture. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of ours. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering, I, we have some great talks on altruism and pragmatism at this conference so far. Can you give us any tips or, I feel like, from those talks, I feel like I actually have not been recognizing those problems. So, can you help, perhaps, do you have any standing orders or... On, on how, to rec how to recognize altruism and pragmatism? Well, uh, I, I think you more need uh, advice on how to recognize the opposites of each of those two, because they are uh, all over the place. I mean, how many times do you hear people justify what they're doing on social grounds because of the help to others? Uh, you see articles about, by Bill Gates himself, you know, on 
what counts in his life is not the, the money he earned, but it's the fact that he's giving so many billions away. And it's a contest, I think, between him and Warren Buffett as to who can give away uh, right. more, faster. Uh, I mean, it's just everywhere. You know? uh, as far as pragmatism, anybody who says uh, there are no blacks and whites, uh, everything is gray, you, you have to uh, uh, compromise. Uh, we have to, uh, uh, you know, get a consensus that will satisfy and work, uh, you know, for the whole society, etc. I mean, I, I, it's so tremendously common that uh, it, it's hard to say what tips people announce those things. Now, if you wanted to say what tips, you know, on something more esoteric like... Uh, you know, uh, does a person believe that concepts are objective or not? Then I can say, well, you should look for this, that, and the other, but the other, just it, it just hits you in the face. Let me try a few of these uh, written ones. Oh, I heard you like the Twilight Zone. Why and which is your favorite episode? Well, it's without doubt the most original, best written uh, television series ever. I was absolutely glued to the set when it originally came on in the 50s. A, a, a brilliant twists, excellent dialogue, characterization right off the bat, uh, just so dramatic. Uh, 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 there's definitely my favorite episode is, um, what is that called? There a lot of, uh, people use it, a lot of objectivist teachers use it in class because it's the most philosophical television drama in 30 minutes ever created. What is it? No, that's not the one. A nice place to visit. That's it, yeah. Now, if you ever well, I get that, uh, that has one of the most complex philosophic messages ever delivered in a, in a drama. Uh, at the end of it, the dumbest student in your class gets the point. Which he would not if you had lectured on it for two hours. It's just a breathtaking work. Uh, it's science fiction, which is pure philosophy. Uh, it's such a work. I think Charles Beaumont uh, wrote that. And he was a frequent writer uh, for The Twilight Zone. Yeah, no, uh, that sort of dates me, but I've never seen anything as good as The Twilight Zone in the last 50 odd years. What did Ayn Rand think about the theory of evolution and is the objectivist ethics based on it? She explicitly said that she had no opinion about the theory of evolution because she did not, she was not a student of biology. She wasn't for it or against it. And obviously, her theory was in no way based on it. Uh, and she didn't, obviously, she didn't believe the alleged alternative of God creating uh, a species. But her theory, her ethics is not based her ethics is based on the industrial revolution, not the theory of revolution of evolution. If you want to put it that way, I wonder if you have made any thoughts on why you had the Aristotelian revival in the Latin Church, why and why it was outright rejected in the uh, Greek Church. I don't know that fact, so I have no uh, view of that. I'm glad to hear it. It is in the Latin. Well, you know the West is been more rational, bad as it is than the East. But I didn't know about, uh, about Thank you. that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. According to objectivism, man faces a fundamental alternative on which the whole of ethics as a field rests, the pre-moral choice to live. My question, is it proper to ask for a reason why one should live? or something at least that is motivating that you should make this choice? Okay. And if it's a proper uh, question. Minute. That's enough, okay. because I've okay. answered that. I answered that specifically in OPAR. Is it an mm -hmm. arbitrary decision or not? And I, I went into that. I showed how the question of should one live is the question should one accept existence as against its alternative. And there is no alternative. Uh, and that arbitrary is a con concept that can be defined only within the context of reason as what it's a denial of and reason is a faculty of knowing existence. 
So you have to accept existence as against non-existence as your primary before you can use such a concept as arbitrary. So you can't then say, maybe the acceptance of existence itself is arbitrary. Now you think about that, because I have already covered that definitively. Yes, over here. Um, Dr. Pigafin, um, Opar, in your section on honesty, you have a single sentence. Is that you, Diana? It is me. Uh, Hi. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in Opar, in the section on honesty, you have a single sentence saying, in a full treatise on ethics, it would be perfectly appropriate to explain, for example, why it's okay to tell lies to protect one's privacy in response to snooping or yeah. in response to snoops. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about, A, what sort of the bounds of that are in terms of what kinds of lies might be appropriate and who would qualify as the snoops? Yeah, I know I really can't. Uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I deliberately did that to differentiate the principle that I was trying to cover from complicated cases. Now, when you get into that, that specific, and you want to define exactly, you'd have to say, well, what is it that you're claiming is private? Was there any contractual or other understanding that somebody else had access to it? Who is it that's claiming access? What is their standing? Is it private or governmental? I mean, are you an adult? Are you a child? You know, there's, there's just so many questions that it, it would come down to. You'd have to specify a particular situation. Can and the same is true. There's a lot of things like that, that why you need a treatise if you wanted to work it out. It's the perfectly legitimate for a doctor to lie to a patient in the hospital if the patient, in his judgment, does not have the strength to cope with the truth and would be you know, derailed in terms of uh, achieving health because of it. Uh, and that's part of his function, is to keep this patient uh, functional. And at some point, he's either going to die or become strong. If he's going to become strong, okay. Um, or else he's going to become strong enough and the doctor gives up hope. But if you then go on to say, well, now, how far does he have to get? I mean, how sick does he have to get? And does he have to have a record of intellectual weakness? And, you know, do we keep track of the doctor? Does he do this in discre I mean, you can't do that. Uh, not in a book on principle, and that's the only one I'd ever write. And I wouldn't even write that one again. So <laughs> that's it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll just really hit this one fast. Can you share the most memorable and pleasant moment in the singer that you had with Ayn Rand? Well, I, I think of four, but I'm not going to. I've discussed them all, I'm sure, uh, in the past. The first night I met her, uh, when Adam Shrugged was finished that night, uh, when I gave her the gift uh, of Mookie, that recording, and her reaction, and when uh, she was walking with me to Random House and said, don't ever give up uh, what you want, it's worth it. I mean, that's four that came to me off the top of my head. Um, please offer your opinion of the recent decisions about immunity for the telecom companies. Uh, I'm not, I don't know all the facts of this, but it, it is, it, I gather what this means is that the government has proclaimed to have the right uh, to eavesdrop on uh, uh, conversations in the name of uh, fighting terrorism without any kind of warrant. If that's what it's meant, then it's definitely wrong. Uh, all of these uh, uh, Bush ideas of uh, uh, negating individual rights in order to fight the war on terrorism, which she is not only not fighting, but going in the opposite direction of encouraging the terrorists, are completely unjustified. Now, you might argue, if there was a declaration of war, then in that context, the government can take extraordinary means. But there is no declaration of war. It's been a whole time sucking up to uh, the terrorists, and the only place that they fought, and even there in a half-assed fashion, was the most secular country uh, in the Mideast. So, uh, the whole, I couldn't even talk about Bush without, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that the, the government should not have any rights to violate individual rights or individual privacy 
uh, that it doesn't have in a normal context uh, uh, until and unless they fought a real shooting war with nuclear bombs uh, all out. Then you can say we're in a total threat and we've got to get this information. But, uh, you know, while they're playing games and killing soldiers by the thousands, and Bush is taking the attitude, well, I'm not going to worry about it, let the next president worry about it. It's all I can say is, the worst insult I could say is, it's Republican. Now, here's a funny question. In the title, Atlas Shrugged, is the word shrugged a verb or an adjective? <laughs> I can't imagine a sentence in which shrugged is an adjective. <laughs> like, I don't know, uh, he was a shrugged man. <laughs> a, a stooped, shrugged man. <laughs> no, it's definitely a verb, the past tense of the verb. <laughs> Could be he has shrugged, he has been shrugging, but, you know, he will be about to shrug. But <laughs> whatever it is, it's, a, it's definitely a verb. I understand why the choice to bring one's mind into focus cannot be motivated. I was wondering whether once one is in focus, the choice to remain that way could be motivated. Yes, I think so, because what you're doing throughout is you're sustaining focus once you're there in the name of pursuing a certain value. If the value or the question, for instance, that was of concern to you, wasn't applicable, you would either turn to something else or you would drift to sleep or drift whatever. So uh, it's once you are in focus, certainly you are controlled by what you do uh, by the, the goals that you have. It's not that focusing in and of itself, it's the act of becoming aware can't be done because of conclusions of awareness. But once you're aware, your awareness is certainly purposeful. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. Good evening, Dr. Pico. Hi. From your experience, who are the low-lying fruit in accepting objectivism, and what's the best way to reach them? <laughs> <laughs> I, you mean like the easiest what's the to best convert? Targets? What's the best targets to reach? The college, kids, I mean, over the years. I mean, you have to ask your own that. Uh, in my experience, the best professions are um, engineers, computer people, and doctors, medical doctors. And uh, without doubt, the best age for anything is from uh, 17 to 29. Because usually 16 or 17 is when they start a thing. And the best people quit in their late 20s, mostly. So uh, you have about a, an open window of a decade uh, there. Now, you know, younger kids are, are better, but then they're, you know, it, you don't really accomplish anything by trying to spread ideas too much among them because they, they don't have the equipment to evaluate them. I mean, it's good to expose them, like, to uh, uh, a good novel, but you, you couldn't have a serious program where you're going to a grade eight and say, now I'm going to teach you objection. They don't have the means to judge it. It would just become propaganda. Uh, so uh, that's what I think. But, you know, I, I would certainly ask uh, your own or the people at the Institute because that's what they do. Uh, and I'm, I'm giving you information from when I was part of the world, which was long ago. <laughs> Thank you. All I know is every time I ask somebody, I like what you do, they always say I work in computers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm wondering... Uh, uh, some of your observations that you might have made about the transitional periods between D's and M's in history and whether those periods haven't been characterized by uh, the rise of false defenders of the, uh, what, what would have been an integrated view. For well, example, the, the false defenders of capitalism or, or today the, those who pose as being tough on terrorism being sort of the enablers of the change. 
Yeah, you know, I think that's true. But first of all, <clears throat> you can't find it throughout history because D is a Kantian phenomenon. And it didn't start till the 19th, mid-late 19th century. And it's only transmuting now. So there's no antecedent, you know, for, uh, well, the, for the, that particular transition. Uh, I'm thinking more of the Hellenistic period and the, the, the transition no, from there's no D in the ancient world. But the transition from a, a, an almost I to the M. Well, I would call that from M1 to M2. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly say that the, the defenders of the M1, the, the, uh, what you're calling the Hellenistic period, paved the way by making the, the pagan viewpoint more and more religious and thereby implicitly apologizing for it. And there's an analogy there to the capitalists here, but the capitalists lost control a long time ago. So the, the fight now is not overcoming uh, capitalism. The fight now is between, well, you know, the religious and those who are actually opposing it, but the pro-capitalist side culturally has aligned itself with religion. Yeah, that's what I mean, that, the, that those who would who, So they're who, the ones that are on coming the, into power. Yeah, that are taking on the name of defending the right idea are doing so with uh, a principle that actually subverts it. Well, I don't think that they're accepting capitalism anymore, even as a rhetoric. In my view, the right is rapidly jettisoning, jettisoning capitalism and coming out much more strongly for government intervention. And that's one of the points in my, my conclusion as to uh, the, the rise of religion is they are embracing the welfare state, environmentalism, and the whole thing. But as one of them put it, what's wrong with the welfare state is not that the government is doing it, but that it's not religious people running the government. If we ran the government, we should be doing exactly that in the name of, you know, WWJD. Uh, but uh, we don't yet. So, yes. Yeah, hi again. Um, I wanted to ask, how does Ayn Rand and objectivism approach mind-altering pharmaceuticals, narcotics, and especially psychedelics? She didn't approach them. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't use them. She was opposed to them, and she regarded them as not equatable with alcohol. She did not think they were merely, you know, a relaxants or... Uh, mood uh, alterator. She thought she thought that they actually affected the functioning of consciousness, that the control you have uh, over the direction of your consciousness, and that that was uh, very wrong, very dangerous to even have that uh, type of experience, let alone on, on a frequent basis. So uh, she was completely opposed to it. Not to alcohol, but of course to, uh, she would believe in alcohol only in moderation. No, you know, she herself didn't like alcohol, although she wished she did. <laughs> she used to say, that's another thing that I wanted to enjoy in Christmas. What do you think about a woman that makes more money than her man but still wants him to support her? <laughs> well, first of all, there is no principle according to which you could say it's the function of a man financially to support a woman, period, no matter what. You're each, <laughs> each person is supposed to be self-supporting. Now, you can very well say, I'll support you, you know, and I think you're, for instance, brilliantly talented. You're right and I'll support you. But the woman could just as well say that about the man. Well, one of them is going to raise the children, and the other will support them. But the amount of money you have is not relevant one way or the other. You can't say, I have more money, therefore I should support you, or it's, you should support me. It doesn't relate to how much money you have. It relates to your understanding of your uh, engagement, your relationship. It is not an absolute that every man has to financially support every woman. Is it morally permissible to approvingly quote the work of a person one knows to be immoral and dishonest 
But would that constitute a sanction of that evil? It, it really depends who the person is and what you're quoting, how bad the evil is, and whether, how your quoting will be interpreted. Now, for instance, Khan is just as evil a person as there is. And if I quote him, even if I quote something that he said approving, like he said, concepts without percepts are empty, percepts without concepts are blind, which, you know, if he meant the right thing by it, it's a g good thing. And I could certainly imagine quoting without feeling the need to say, I don't like him, he's monstrous, but just this one sentence. But then it's clear I'm taking a sentence from a total uh, philosophy, uh, and it's not his philosophy. But uh, suppose it's somebody, a Kantian today, that I'm actively fighting, that I think is a, is, is a real uh, threat, and there's, no, there's nobody else has uttered that sentence. I'd have to ask myself, I'd rather not give that person the sanction and the publicity just so that it would be out there in print that Peacock thinks has read and liked some part of this book. I asked myself in a case like that, I mean, if it's somebody I hated, somebody I thought was really destructive, I'd say, what is it that's so crucial that I can't paraphrase, that I can't condense, that I can't remove? Now, I've had enough experience as an editor of stuff where, you know, you're told 200 words have to go out of this 300-word page, and it's got to be within two hours. And you do it, and the continuity, and the logic, everything still remains. It's a little terser than it was before. So I don't, I don't think there's ever a practical situation where you have to do it. And I wouldn't do it if, it, uh, if it's someone active that you could be taken as that. But uh, in most cases, if you're talking about classical figures, it doesn't mean anything. Once they achieve the status of classics, uh, no one thinks that uh, you subscribe to their views, to all of their views.